Emeritus Excellency friends, and it's a great honor to be invited here today and to celebrate with you and your wonderful poet, and our wonderful poet, of course, and WBA. I'm not regrettably a Torah scholar, as you know, and, and of course we're confined to reading and in translation also, which is a, another uh, difficulty perhaps or barrier between the language of poetry and, and the true meaning. But what I wanted to talk a little bit about today is, is the idea of friendship and the idea of influence between two very important figures and who happen to live at the same time, who happen to find um, close affinities um, in terms of both their creative and their spiritual lives. But I also wanted to think, uh, in, in revisiting Yeats in the light of Tagore, I wanted to think a little bit about the idea of influence and how we can absorb influences over a long period of time. Many critics will point to quite a short period of Yeats's life, for example, as key to his friendship with Tagore and the, the reason that was that he gravitated towards this poet. But I'd like, in a way, to, to reflect on that a little differently and to say instead that Tagore was in many ways a manifestation of what Yeats had been seeking in his own creative life. And so they're coming together and uh, encourage Yeats to rethink um, a lot of his earlier work uh, and a lot of his own approach to the relationship between religion and art, um, specifically. So I suppose I'm beginning then with that idea, the idea that we are obviously commemorating and celebrating the war, but we're also thinking about the capacity of artists and writers to influence the world. And even writers who are writing, as you pointed out, in a language that is not a world language uh, and that have to be translated to reach their audience, uh, unfortunately, and yet manage to do that. You know, their, their work, their ideas, their thoughts are carried on this kind of river of language out into the world, and they have this long lasting um, effect. To also re return to a point um, that you made about Yeats and Yeats' devotion to Tagore, and the, the devotion of writers to one another, the need for us to work together to support and bring forward our artistic work, um, and you know, build community, build readers for this work, I think is very important. And it's especially important when we think of the relationship between nations and between languages. And the need for that solidarity, to return to your final point, that need to invest in other visions other than our own, without necessarily looking for something selfish for ourselves, I think is a very important thing um, to learn. As has been noted, um, both Yates and Tabor were both winners of the Nobel Prize, um, and in that way they both made a unique contribution to the world of letters. Um, but they also made very important contributions to their own societies and cultures. And obviously, Yeats is a towering figure in the Irish context, and as many have seen, placed modern Ireland, the, the new Irish state, um, which was only in its absolute infancy, of course, when he won the Nobel Prize, in a way it brought that state to world prominence. So it is, a, in fact, as you know, um, a tiny country. So Dubois was the first um, Asian to win the Nobel and that in itself is symbolic of a more inclusive approach to literature uh, and artistic expression and that idea that we must always be open uh, to, to looking at a variety of cultures and their interconnections rather than creating hierarchies um, among them. At many points in history, the West has turned eastwards in search of meaning. But Yeats's engagement with Eastern thought, as I'll, I'll point out in a moment, uh, and with religions other than his own, rather than the one he was born into, was very thoughtful and deliberate. And so he didn't just engage with the fashion of the moment um, in that sense. He had a deep and enduring um, sense of a global approach to meaning and to artistic production. Um, and that very much influenced all his work right through his life, and not just at this particular uh, period of intense engagement um, with Tagore. His respect for Tagore's achievement 
and finds its way into the treatment of the natural world. Yeats, especially in his, in his early and late uh, periods, engaged in very deep and thoughtful ways with nature. Um, but also in that um, image that, of course, uh, you spoke of, the relationship between the, the tiny and the huge, the relationship between the, the artist's job or mission, I suppose, I think mission is too um, cerebral a word, the artist's calling to represent and attend to the tiniest details and to understand that those represent a much larger pattern of meaning. This was something that both those poets um, shared. So to bore in that sense really encouraged and enabled Yeats to move his, his philosophical thinking onwards and in a sense to mature, I think, as a philosophical and religious thinker within his poetry. So the two most important points of connection between these um, poets, their, their personal connection and their textual affinities, converge in 1912. This was the year in which they met in London at first, and it was also the year, of course, in which Yeats wrote his introduction to uh, to Moore's Gitanjali, um, that was translated by its author into English and was the first of his works to become freely and widely available to Western readers. So Yeats was commissioned to write um, the introduction to this work, and he became immersed in the manuscript of the poems. And there's an interesting point where he talks about carrying the manuscript around with him and reading it in all these different locations, but then having to put it aside because he's so moved by it, so affected by this work. And I think that's a very powerful image for us to think, the idea of you know, carrying a text with us, the one that we want to return to again and again, we want to absorb and internalize. But that also we recognize that this is a text where not just responding to it in a cerebral way, you know, as a scholar or someone doing a job of, of writing about it, but in a much more personal and deeply felt um, way. He found these poems, as he admits, he found the poems extremely moving, speaking as they did to the interwoven nature of spiritual and human worlds, which had been Yeats' own concern uh, for many years at this point. And these lyrics he wrote, he's referring to, uh, to Boer's work, which are in the original, my Indians tell me, full of subtlety, of rhythm, of untranslatable delicacies of colour, of metrical invention, display in their thought a world I have dreamed of all my life long. I think that sense that in reading the work, Yeats sensed that he was a writer who was bringing into language a world that in a way Yeats was still try, striving to understand, still striving to uh, express. So the capacity of Du Bois' poems to bring a dream world, and of course a dream world was as important to Yeats as the real world, and we can kind of apprehend such a thing. So Du Bois' ability to bring the dream world to artistic reality and demonstrated through a combination of form and beauty and intense spirituality. Uh, and this creates, in fact, called attention to the mechanical nature of Western art, as Yeats perceived it at that time. So to the joylessness, in effect, of Western art. So what Yeats was going to to, or to experience was that sense of depth of perception and a kind of intuitive combination of artistic um, production or realization with this deeply felt spiritual uh, belief. And rather than seeing this vision as something perhaps alien to a European sensibility, Yeats saw it as formative of a more profound artistic achievement. So in other words, he saw it more as leading the way for a new and deeper form of art. He called to more's writing the work of supreme culture, of a tradition where poetry and religion are the same thing. And it was this conjoining of artistic and spiritual purpose that proved most inspiring for Yeats, and I think arguably is, is what is most profound for us as we uh, encounter to Boer's work. Yeats's own symbolic practices, of course, had been aimed at introducing ancient spirituality into Ireland's contemporary reality. Um, and, you know, he was only partly in many ways satisfied with what he had achieved um, in that way. And while Yeats's attention to craft 
because Yates, we know from looking at his manuscripts and reading his notebooks, you know, he worked extraordinarily hard at his art. Um, and this tends, I think, it has tended for critics to privilege the idea of hard work, you know, as an artistic endeavor over the idea of um, the more religious um, implications of symbolism. But some critics, I think, have seen beyond this, Terence Brown as an, an example, and he has argued that Yeats used symbolism as what he calls a vital religious practice. And I think that's a very important observation, because what it does is it links a practice that you know, poets, other poets of Yeats' generation um, were practicing, but it infuses it with this much more um, spiritual um, dimension or depth. And it's important, too, that Yeats saw that activity as really important in overthrowing or overcoming this emptiness of Western art, and specifically what he saw as an increasing commercialization of the British Empire. So in that way, he sees the artist's practice as not just being an aesthetic one, if you like, but in a sense having a moral and a spiritual purpose. So Yeats first became interested in India in the 1880s, and through the activities of the Dublin Hermetic Society and the Dublin um, Theosophical Society mainly. And in these groupings, and they shared quite a lot of members, um, Eastern and Western schools of thought came together, as well as ancient and what we might see as modern um, mysticisms. And this was also in parallel with the translation of Eastern texts, or the retranslation in some cases of Eastern texts into English. And among the high points of Yeats' engagement with these um, bodies or organisations was the opportunity to meet Mohini Chatterjee, who was a disciple of the Theosophical Society's co-founder, Madame Blavatsky. And Chatterjee left uh, a really lasting impression on Yeats, um, a young man at the time, really reinforcing the revelatory power of Eastern thought for Yeats um, and prompting this lifelong interest so in a sense, sowing the seed that would later be realized in Yeats's friendship um, with Du Bois. And later, when contemplating Du Bois' work in writing his introduction, um, Yeats would dwell on this combination of the uncanny and the familiar in this relationship between East and West, which he describes as a whole people, a whole civilization, immeasurably strange to us, seem to have been taken up into this imagination. And yet we are not moved because of its strangeness, but because we have met our own image, as though we had walked in Rossetti's willow wood or heard perhaps for the first time in literature, our voice as in a dream. And it's interesting again that Yeats returns to the idea of the dreamlike experience, this kind of disembodied or otherworldly experience as key to his interaction um, with Tabor. What is important there, of course, is that he's linking the idea of strangeness and familiarity, so that something can be at once particular to the culture in which it's produced, which goes back to the idea of um, the particularity, uh, the specificity of Du Bois' work, um, and of course the fact um, that he was working from uh, Bengal, but the fact that this can transmit itself as a universal, this can speak to people. A, in, in all kinds of situations all over the world. So it speaks to humankind in this, in this broader way. So despite these affinities that Yeats immediately recognised, he also could see the challenges involved in coming to know the life and beliefs of a poet who was distant from him and in culture and experience and also, of course, um, in language. So it's fitting that he begins his introduction to the book with a dialogue. And he is specifically concerned with this really key point that he wants the world to read the Boer's work, to understand the Boer, to, to have that encounter that he had had. Um, and he describes um, him as, as great in music as in poetry. And his songs are sung wherever Bengali is spoken. I think it's very important that, of course, we have music here today, not just um, the spoken word. There's the capacity for music to reach us all in different ways, even if we don't understand the language. Of course, it's very important, and it's something Yeats was very um, attuned to. And so inspired was Yeats by this manuscript when he first encountered it, that he, he expressed an intention to travel to India, as he later confirmed in a letter to the Boer, quote, to hear some minstrels sing your poems, 
and to study the world out of which you have made them. And so again, that combination of a recognition of universality, but a desire to honour Tagore by visiting the Greece, his own space, his own place, and his environment. So Yeats perceived Tagore as having access to this unbroken tradition, as he saw it. And yet he also saw this apparent unity as a way of thinking through some of the tensions in Yeats's own life and work, specifically between um, ideas of the spiritual, um, which Yeats had been grappling with since he was a young man, and the demands of art. And these were always, in a sense, you know, in this challenged and uneasy relationship in Yeats's life and work. And this was in part um, both clarified and deepened by his sense of what Tagore was doing in his poetry specifically. And that idea that you could combine intellectual understanding and popular story and song. So in other words, you could learn from what ordinary people were sharing uh, in their own villages, in their own uh, experiences, in their own families, and in these kind of intimate situations. You could learn and bring together those traditions. And you could produce an art that would therefore be meaningful both to the greatest scholars and to the ordinary man or woman on the street. Um, and this, I think, is something which is, brings us back again and again, of course, to Tagore, is that he was able to do that, and Yeats recognised um, that he could do that. Um, and he speaks of this idea of writers gathering from learned and unlearned metaphor and emotion, and carrying it back to the multitude. So the thought of the scholar and the noble, as he describes it, is brought back um, to the multitude. So that sense of the, the circle of gathering um, emotion and idea, and then transforming it through art and giving it back to the people was this really important kind of cyclical process that Yeats was very interested in. And in fact, that he also reflects on and talks about in terms of the aims of the Irish literary revival and that idea of gleaning, um, you know, the art from the kind of far side of the west of Ireland and then bringing it onto the stage and having people uh, global as well as learn and, and understand that. So in that way, the cycle of knowledge and the cycle of art in itself is um, expressed and deepened from one generation um, to the next. So what Yeats, I suppose, is really interested in this is that you can, you can have coexisting um, different levels. You can acknowledge different levels of society. You can acknowledge certain hierarchies, and yet you can also make them meaningful to place them in dialogue with one another. So, <clears throat> Tabor's own work has been characterised as affirming a faith in life and humanity, not through remaining focused on the quotidian only, but through asserting the freedom to move beyond it and towards this higher uh, being. So this transcendence does, not, transcendence does not ultimately represent a rejection of individuality, um, but it supports the personal relationship and the role of symbolism in articulating or expressing um, that sense of the personal. And interestingly, Tagore's work embraced sensory existence in a way that I think was particularly attractive to Yeats. Um, and this is uh, the words of Tagore, I feel the embrace of freedom in a thousand bonds of delight. No, I will never shut the doors of my senses. And this, the immediacy of bodily experience, um, was uh, attracted to Yeats right through his life, but perhaps even more so um, as an older man than a, as a younger. And it was very significant to him that Tagore's spiritual significance was born out of a desire to live, not a desire to stew life, you know, not a desire to become aesthetic or to, to shed the sensory world. For a couple of years prior to his 1912 trip to England, Tagore had been engaged in exploring the deeper unity of mystical practices, this new inner sense, as he describes it, and that expresses a form of religious experience. And Yeats, at the same time, was also grappling with the role of the interior life um, as a way of um, expressing that, that sense of a spiritual being um, in, a, in a meaningful way, in a way that could be meaningful to um, a wide audience or a wide readership. And this, I think, is the affinity, this the two um, poets. 
Um, they also both inherited an idea of solitude as part of an artistic process. We see that in, in Towards the Golden Boat, for example. Um, but elsewhere, the singular and the reciprocal combine. In the words of Broken Song, for example, this is particularly applicable today, the singer alone does not make a song. There has to be someone who, he, who hears. One man opens his throat to sing, the other sings in his mind. And that idea of you know, the, both the expressive power of art, but also the power to, to internalize, you know, to have it uh, acted on you from within, I think is very important. And you know, to embrace that, we saw the mystical as at the center, as he says, of all that I think and all that I write. So, and um, to conclude then, um, with I think perhaps the most important point for us today, which is the commitment of both these poets to internationalism. They both sought to communicate with readers and audiences outside the country of their birth. Uh, and to go back to the earlier point about nationalism, you know, radical nationalism is often associated with turning inwards. And it's, it's really important that both these were poets who reached across borders and sought to communicate across borders and to enrich their own creative and intellectual and indeed spiritual processes uh, by doing so. And of course, they both change the face of modern poetry and arguably of modern, modern literature by doing so. Tagore refers to the freedom of detachment, as he calls it. This was when he was lecturing in 1916 in the US. And there, in that lecture, he contrasts the idea of an obsessive nationalism with what he terms a vague cosmopolitanism. And this was the kind of difficult line that Yeats was also trying to tread uh, between being sort of drawn towards, perhaps persuaded towards, you know, physical force nationalism as it existed in Ireland at the time, of course, was exemplified by his great love, Maud Gaughan. So there was that on the one hand, but then there was the draw of a more spiritual and more international um, expression of art that detached itself from these particular kind of political uh, positions. And so Yeats was trying to um, kind of tread the line between those. And I think it's particularly interesting at this moment in 1912 when Yeats was really struggling, I think, with the more political dimensions of nationalism, that that was when he found Tabor's work reinvigorating him as a poet and sending him back to what he saw, what Yeats saw as his main purpose, which was this spiritual unity that he was engaging with and thinking through. And he is an interesting um, quote, I think, is, again, to go back to the point of his desire to represent Tabor's poetry to a range of readers and really kind of bring it to the, his own um, circle of, of friends and associates. And he said he specifically did not want Tabor to be, you know, uh, what he describes as a writer of facile English for English religious readers, but a master of very arduous measures, which I think is a wonderful phrase. I think it's a phrase that really speaks to the power of Tabor's work, which is uniting of form and meaning. So not really purveying Eastern thought in some accessible form, but rather a uh, true, most extraordinary simplicity of language, in fact, creating a very complex range of ideas. And this was something, of course, that Yeats was uh, quite envious of, I think, was um, Tabor's ability to combine that sense of complexity and simplicity. And so, in many ways, I think we can see the influence of Tabor's work on Yeats, and it extends right throughout Yeats' life in terms of how he develops his philosophical thought. That, that in a way, that friendship and that influence is a microcosm, just as that tiny dewdrop example of Tabor's wider global significance and his power to speak across nations and across generations. Thank you.